That looks good. All right. Okay, welcome back everybody. Thanks for taking a moment to join us today for the second of our two-part series to prepare you for the Bob Mark business model competition, which is coming up in January. And today we'll be focusing on explaining your market opportunity. And so the key function with this is that when you're presenting in a competition or, or elsewhere presenting your business idea, one of the key points that is critical is to make sure that you actually have your uh, market opportunity well-defined. So that is going to be imperative in terms of being able to actually convince anybody or for you just to be able to demonstrate that anybody is available to buy your product and that you're knowledgeable in terms of what's required in order to be able to get to that point. So I'm just going to minimize that so it's not in the way. <laughs> so fortunately, my Zoom skills have gotten a little bit rusty. So, so we'll continue on. Now, again, my name is John Lanen, and I'm a teaching professor in the College of Business. I am here with our director of Husky Innovate, Lisa Casper, and a few people in the room who are also interested in this topic. So thank you for joining us. Moving right along. So our agenda, I have just gone through the welcoming. So in terms of team introductions, um, we're interested in knowing who's in the room. So if you would like to share with us who is online, that would be great, as well as in the room here, and then we'll continue on with the rest of our agenda. So how about, um, start with Michael. Uh, so my name is Michael Ngala. I'm a graduate student uh, at the College of Computing Department and I'm uh, taking a data science in my second year. So uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Michael. I'm uh, a major physicist. I'm an um, engineering grad student. This is a pretty interesting stuff. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Luis. Uh, I'm an undergrad, and I am currently working on getting STEM as a budget option for my uh, community backend. Okay. Hi, I'm Krishna. I'm studying my master's in data science in the College of Hong Okay, so that covers who we have in the room, and we have a few people online. How about Alia? Would you like to introduce yourself? Okay, we'll move right along to and Krishna. That's you, apparently. Oh, there's another Krishna. Krishna, excuse me. Fireflies, would you like to introduce yourself? Okay, moving around, moving down the list. Read. Hi, I was uh, in person last week, um, but I have some obligations this week. My name is Reed Downs. I'm a graduate physics student, uh, second year master's, and I'm really here to just continue learning what I don't know and trying to fill in some of the gaps. I have ideas, but none of them are really in a position where I could present them to a group. Okay. Thanks for joining us, Reed. Nice to have you with us. And then Seth. Hi, I'm Seth. I'm a uh, applied physics graduate student. Uh, I'm I'm in the same boat as Reed. I'm just here to learn as much as I can. Okay, perfect. I hope we can help to fill in some of the gaps that you may have, and um, that this will be somewhat meritorious of your time. So, again, thank you all for being here. So in terms of our agenda, what we'll be focusing on is this terminology called the total available market, service available market, and target market in terms of really bring, being able to break down the opportunity that you have from a market standpoint. 
We'll take a look at some resources that are available. And certainly we can't cover everything here, but we'll take a peek at Statista, which is a database that Michigan Tech has available, which is a fee-based uh, fee service. And as a student or graduate student here at Michigan Tech, if you are affiliated with the university, you have access to that tool for free, um, or maybe better said prepaid, it's, it's available to you as a matter of your being a student. So, and of course, we can talk through some questions as need be. So we'll move along just to kind of give you a little taste of what more there is to come here in the following slides. I've indicated or I've included here a graphic that has to do with the ebook market. So let's envision that for our purposes right now in this example that we are coming out with an ebook reader. And everybody wants to read books on an e-reader, okay? Obviously, there is not going to be an opportunity to introduce a new ebook reader without displacing some incumbent technologies that are already in place. So the, maybe one of the, the available options that comes to mind for you would be the Amazon Kindle, I guess. However, that's not, the, that's not the only player in that market. So what that might mean, taking that a step further, is that if we want to come out with, a, with an e-book, we might want to consider what actual technologies are out there that will be able to actually utilize the book that we're coming out with. So if ours is compatible with the Amazon Kindle, then our access to the market is potentially 71%. If we come out one with one that's compatible or a version that's compatible with iBooks, we add 14, et cetera. So we can't just say that by coming out with an ebook, everybody is going to be able to read our book. We need to be able to actually get to the people who have the appropriate type of reader. Hello. Hey. So um, in this case, the global ebook market size is estimated to be valued at 19, almost $20 billion in 2022 and is projected to reach 32 billion by 2032. So in about the next nine years, it's going to grow by another third or so. So pretty, pretty good growth opportunity there. However, even though it's a large, fairly large market and growing, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's a, that's a perfect opportunity for every ebook that might be coming onto the market without really understanding more about how to get onto each of these different platforms. Okay, so I have some other examples that we're going to take a look at. So if that one didn't make quite perfect sense, hopefully some of the other ones will as we get into it or make more sense. <clears throat> so I give you these terms already and I wanted to describe these a little bit more before we get into the particulars of how to go about this. So the total addressable market, we characterize this in terms of how big is the universe that you intend to serve. So with the ebook example, you might say that every possible ebook that ever was um, printed or published would be a better word. Every ebook that was ever published could constitute our market universe. However, as I've already indicated, not all of those ebooks are going to be compatible with every ebook technology that exists today, and we'll get into that. So in terms of who has the problem that I solved, the people who use ebook readers would have the problem of wanting more ebook texts to use on their system, on their device. So that could be a, that could be a characterization of the total addressable market with that example. Moving along, the served available market reduces that number in terms of how many can I realistically reach through of the available channels. So remember, if I come out with a new ebook and I only make it available to the Amazon Kindle, then I've reduced my market opportunity to that 71%. Okay, so I've eliminated 29% of that total addressable market. I've eliminated that. 
And now I'm focusing on only the technology that's compatible with my book. Another way to say this is who wants the solution and can find me and find my offering. So who wants the solution? People that want to read an ebook on the topic that I have and can find me. So I might be searchable on the Kindle platform, for instance. If somebody has an iBook reader and my book is not available on that platform, then they can't find me. I don't exist. Oops, excuse me. And then finally, a further reduction of this is the target market, or we call this the service obtainable market or SOM for short. You can say SOM or you can say target market. Typically in a, in a pitch competition or in a business plan, something of that order, we'll, we'll use the term target market. And so if we're using that term, it has a definition, which is what part of the service served available market can I realistically capture and serve? Now remember, we only have 24 hours in a day. We can't probably realistically by ourselves or even a small company probably cannot get to everybody on the planet in a 24 hour period or in a week or a month or a year or five years or 10 years or 20 years. Okay. Some well-known texts have been um, available across the planet for decades and still haven't reached everybody. So geographically speaking, we have a limitation. Time speaking, we have a limitation. Just capability of our own production processes, we may have a limitation and so forth. Another way to look at this is who needs my offering and actually will pay me for it. So that means that somebody needs to actually have money and be willing to spend that and will pay me for it. So I need to be able to get it to them and I need them to have money and I need them to actually close that transaction for me to be paid for it. If somebody exists and they don't have money, it's a non-starter. If somebody exists that wants my product but I cannot get to them, it's a non-starter. Okay, I see something in the chat, so. Okay, all right, thank you, Alia. Nice to have you with us. So we'll continue moving along. Of course, you can ask more questions. I have a couple more examples here to go through and then we can um, certainly look into these in more detail. So I picked a couple of just general product ideas for us to start with and give you some examples of the type of information that's pretty readily available. So this one on the global toothbrush market, something we all can understand very easily. This particular report is from this website, maximizemarketresearch.com. I just did a Google search on toothbrush, global toothbrush market, and this report came up. So this is only one um, view of the data that, that exists in this report. But here we can see the market size as it relates to this market size in dollars, billions. Okay, so we're not quite sure what this means, market size, whether that is a um, total available market, service obtainable market, etc. What is that exactly? We're not quite sure based on this particular example. So we would have to look into that a little bit more to actually uh, be assured as, as far as what they're talking about there. If it would say target market, we might want to make that assumption that this is the market that this that a company in this market space could realistically address. Okay, and it could very well be. Okay, so we can see here 2022, 2029. This is the type of information that somebody would want to see in a pitch. So what is the opportunity now basically last year? What is it, what is it predicted to grow to over the course of the next few years? 
Okay, so within the next seven, six, seven years from now. So compound annual growth rate is what CAGR is. That basically means what is it growing to next year? And then what is it growing to the next year? And then what is it growing to the next year? What is it growing to the next year? And if we take a look at what that compounding effect is, we have the compound annual growth rate of 3.4% over that time period of seven years. Okay. So that would be interesting to know. When we're trying to establish what our target market opportunity is, and to explain our target market, we would also want to say something about who are the companies that are already competing in that market space. And this particular report was very nice in the sense of it gives us a pretty decent list of the different companies that are key players in that area. This might not be a complete list. For instance, if we go to Dollar General, we can buy a toothbrush there. Wherever that toothbrush comes from, I have no idea. It might be from one of the companies on this list, or it might not be. It, we can't really say that for sure. Okay, but many of these companies are pretty well-known brand names. And by being pretty well-known brand names, we can probably make an educated guess that this these are the larger players in the industry, at least. It's hard to say whether that is the, whether them being the larger players in the industry means that they constitute the largest market share of that industry is another question that would, that would be good to validate. Okay, and it's not said here specifically. Okay, but anyway, this gives us a nice list of companies that we could potentially look into if we were in this market space and trying to explain what our market opportunity actually is. So here, regional analysis, that, that's pretty straightforward, I think, in terms of where the opportunity is for selling toothbrushes. We can see that by this color coding system, according to this chart, North America is about half the, half the opportunity. Okay, so if we went beyond that, Let's say that this $7.01 billion is our market opportunity. If we were only focusing on the United States, we'd already reduce that number to about 3.5 billion. Okay, so in terms of explaining our market opportunity, we can't really use the $7 billion number if our focus is going to be on North America because we've already reduced it down by about half, whatever that actual number is, a little bit more than half, I guess, in North America. Okay. And then I need to move this to the side a little bit if I can. All right. Okay, so we can further distill this, this market opportunity into different product lines that we have. So soft, medium, and firm, if you're familiar with toothbrush types. We can see that, again, if we only offer soft toothbrushes, we're reducing our opportunity. And again, there are no numbers here. All I have on this slide is just a graphical representation of what that might be. But just in rough terms, for 2022, it's maybe a little bit more than a third, maybe 40%. So we're reducing that $7 billion down to about 40% if we're only talking about soft toothbrushes. If we're talking about medium or soft and medium, then you know, it looks like we're up maybe around 70% of that 7 billion. And if we include all three types, then presumably we're talking that 7 billion number for 2022. So as you can see, this gets complicated might not be the best word, but there are many different ways to look at your market opportunity. Okay, so when you're explaining what your market opportunity is in a presentation or just as a matter of your business plan, it's important to be able to understand how all these different characteristics fit together. You have incumbent technologies or incumbent players. You'll need to be able to explain 
how are you going to displace some of that 7 billion that is held by Colgate Palmolive or else we just take them off, we just remove that from our market opportunity. How do we explain which geographic area we are going to be able to cover? Or are we going to cover all of them for that 7 billion? If we're not going to, then we need to remove that from our projection. Okay, and similarly by the different types of products that are out there. Any questions about that or anything that I've covered so far? Online or in the room? So they Quick question. Okay, we'll take uh, we'll take uh, your question online here first. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so we were talking a lot about taking oper like the market opportunity. Is there a way we could try to be bringing new people in, maybe with new things that haven't been offered before, rather than trying to steal exist or not not steal, but like convince existing customers that they want to join us, like growing the market instead of assessing what's already there? Sure, absolutely. So as you are saying, and we have plenty of examples of new products that come up, come around uh, from time to time. And my, my favorite, just very simple example, is there another room for a bag of chips on the <laughs> chip rack at the grocery store? Apparently so, because from time to time, there's a new brand of chips that shows up on the grocery store shelf. So in that sense, um, you'd have to evaluate, well, is it actually a direct competitor to something that's already out there? Or are you actually getting into a brand new space? So for my example with the chips, I would say that you're competing with the, te with the things that are already out there. So we have, uh, we have in our home, my own personally, personal experience is that in our home, we have a, uh, intolerance to corn. So when blue chips, when blue corn chips showed up on the grocery shelf, that was, that was uh, appealing to us. And from my perspective, that was a new product because I couldn't buy the, the yellow corn chips to begin with because we had issues with that in our house. So when the new, when the blue corn chips showed up, that was, to me, that was a new product because I wasn't spending any money on chips. However, if your customer or if somebody goes to the, to the grocery store expecting to buy a bag of yellow corn chips and they decide, I'm going to try these blue ones instead, then you have taken a customer from the yellow corn chips and you have attracted them to the blue corn chips. So... Again, it's not always as straightforward as it might seem. You know, is a bag of chips, a bag of chips, a bag of chips, a bag of chips? Well, it kind of depends, <laughs> all right? So that wasn't that wasn't helpful, was it, Reed? <laughs> I mean, it kind of was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in the sense of, yeah, this gets kind of complicated. But um, so here's another one. So for instance, if, um, if somebody comes out with a satellite, telephone, which we've, we've had satellite phones around for a while already. They're not very commonly used just yet. But if somebody decides that they want a satellite phone, um, is that taking away from the phone that they are already carrying around, the cell phone that they have in their pocket? You know, that could be another example. Well, it may or may not be. I guess it, a very quick follow-up is Sure. Is there one that is consistently more effective, more one strategy that is consistently more effective than the other? Like, is it consistently more effective to break ground on an existing customer base or try to build a new customer uh, base? Sure, that's a great, that's a that's an awesome question. The the one of the things I'm just going to maybe address it this way, and there there are probably 50 different ways to answer this question, but I'm gonna address it this way. If we're going into a new market space with a new product, we have a steep learning curve to overcome with that. So that's where sometimes it's good to, to start with something that's in an existing space and then move people over to the new technology. So for instance, um, my, I mentioned this last time, but my, my own career, I was dealing with automotive parts catalogs. 
And we started, and it was kind of, or we were somewhat limited by the available technologies at the time. But my product line, we started sending out catalog updates on compact disks. So CDs with data updates on them. And the technology evolved where we were able to actually start pushing out updates on the web. And this was early, early days of you know, reliable web technology. And it really wasn't super great at that time. We're talking around the year 2000. So there was kind of early to be pushing lots of data out um, on the web. However, our customer was not ready for that. So within the automotive space that we were dealing with, the people that were using our data, they were not connected to the web yet. Uh, so we would have to put in some technologies and things like that, which was clunky at best, um, not, not feasible at worst maybe, to actually get them connected to our system. So you might run into some of those kinds of barriers, but the thing is, now we had to train them on an entirely new business process because these are, I don't know if anybody knows what microfish is anymore in the room, but there was this ancient technology that, that um, it was still being used a lot at the time, but they were using something called microfish, which I won't even bother to explain because it doesn't matter. Um, they were using that. And we had to train them on how to actually use this new technology. And then we also had to train them on how to connect to the internet and things like that. And I'll tell you that we invested, my company invested about $200,000 in, in developing a web-based system. We sold one and we killed the project. So, because it, the technology just wasn't ready for it and the learning curve was too steep. You know, if we could have been 15 years further in, in terms of the technology development or technology maturity curve, then we would have been ready for that. We would have been okay, probably. And I'm sure it's happening now. Well, we're, I just updated my computer yesterday or the day before, and I don't know how many gigabytes of data I downloaded. But um, so we can do that nowadays. We just couldn't do it then. So, so I was gonna... yeah. sorry, go ahead. So, uh, yeah, I was just going to come back to your question. So which is more effective? There are so many things that need to be considered if we're actually going into a new space like that. And I mentioned a couple of them. Yeah, it sounded like to sum up everything you said in a, um, in a way that I understand it, it sounds like one of the most important assessments to make is to consider the growing pains of a new market from an existing market. Yeah. I'll, I'll take that. Thank you. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah, thank you for your explanation too. Sure, of course. And then we had another question. Yeah, so when we enter a new market with a, with a say, new product or service, and we are not sure about the selling price, then how do we come up with these numbers, say this must be the market size? Like, how can we come up with that with those numbers? Sure. So the question in the room, if you didn't hear it online, was basically had to do with pricing. How do we establish the size of a market if we don't know even know what our market or what our product is going to be priced at? So I can say along my career history here, I've, I've actually been trained in pricing. And I do know that there are people that make a career just out of pricing. And that's for the, the experience that I had was we were, we were dealing with pretty well established products things that have been around for a long time and we still can make careers with pricing experts. So, so it becomes tricky if we have a brand new product that we're trying to bring to market and we're trying to establish a price for it. But my experience is there are, there are a few different ways of pricing without going into all of that right now. But in terms of what we're talking about here, establishing a size for our market, we can use some of these numbers that we're talking about here in terms of our serve um, attainable market, our SAM or our SOM. And we could put some numbers to that in terms of uh, later in this presentation and just a slide or two, I'm going to talk about scaling up. And we could, from our own perspective, that's what an investor or uh, that's what somebody would be interested in if they were looking at our business plan, how are we actually going to 
establish that market from a size perspective based on the product that we have and the pricing that we're using. So it might not be um, too far of a stretch if we're working with a product that's in an established industry at least to follow the, the pricing model that's already that people are already familiar with. So for instance, um, here over the last maybe 20 years, people have gotten more comfortable with the idea of monthly pricing on things. And I think that grew out of people were used to paying back in the old days, dinosaur days that some of us are from. People were used to paying a monthly telephone bill. People were used to paying a monthly utility bill. Those industries have been around forever, let's say, for our purposes. Now, so when cell phones came along, it wasn't a big stretch for people to, to embrace the idea of paying a month-to-month -month telephone bill. When cable TV came along, which was a little bit later, um, not necessarily before um, after cell phones, but after utility power, I'm saying, so um, it wasn't a big stretch for people to pay a month-to-month -month bill for cable TV. When that changed to satellite TV, people were used to paying a monthly bill for that. And we pay monthly bills for apps now like crazy. So you know, sometimes it's charged on an annual basis, but it kind of comes back to the idea of a month-to-month-to-month-to-month -to -month -to -month -to -month kind of bill. So when it comes to the... Um, the products that we're pricing in terms of how we're going to do that based on what I just said, following some existing models that people are exam are already familiar with can be a good approach on that. Now layered on top of that, this is where it gets, gets into a you know career on pricing lecture, but short of that, well, let me go so far as to say that the more successful businesses tend to pay, tend to price based on value, not on cost. So we'll we'll for instance be able to establish what is the what is the value that somebody actually gets out of something. Thank you. Yes. This is for my senior design, not the report. Instead the report thing of what. What is um, what is the what is the value of something rather than what is the actual cost that it it is for us to be able to produce that and get it to somebody. So for instance, um, back when I was working again with the software, we knew what the competitive products or substitute products, like I mentioned Microfish, there were some other um, computer-based systems that were out there. We knew what those cost. They weren't our system and they were a different technology altogether, but we knew what those cost. So, and we knew what the value of that was in terms of how many parts, in our case, it was parts of catalog systems. So we knew how many you know, parts were being ordered based on use of those systems. So if we could say that the use of that system generates, I'll just pick, I'll pick a number. Let's say that the use of that system generates a million dollars a year for a nice round number. We could we could use that as a basis to establish our pricing. Well, you're using our system to generate a million dollars a year in revenue. So based on that, we could come up with some justification for having some piece of that. Okay. So I wouldn't be, I, I hesitate to say, you know, to suggest that you could use that as a mutually exclusive approach to pricing. There are many other factors that come into, come into mind. But as compared to, say, um, we know that it took us, you know, it cost us $200,000 to, to make this um, software, and there will be operating costs. I'm going to ignore those right now. But let's say that it, if we sell that to a hundred customers, what is that? Two thousand dollars. We need to, we need to be able to recover from each customer. So, would it be right to price it at two thousand dollars based on the, you know, hundred customers, two thousand dollars a piece? 
yeah, we're going to be able to charge much more with a justification of value than we are on the basis of just what the cost is. And again, I ignored a lot of other costs that go into that just for simplicity right now. All right, so anyway, not sure if that helped, but again, can get kind of complicated on the pricing side. But the idea is to work up to a number, not to not to work backward to a number in terms of opportunity back to whatever you charge. So, Chad, would it be, um, he asked about the pricing, but what about finding the market size? Could you do that with Statista? Okay, we'll get to possibly, um, again, there are so many different factors. Could you just divide out the, the market size based on, for instance, if you have, you know that you have 20 key players there, um, you know, and you just want to play share averages or something like that, you know, what is the, if we had 20 players, how much of that would each of those on average, you know, bear, or what would their share be kind of thing, or just using straight kind of division on that, which is dangerous, but we could possibly put some sort of model together like that. Again, it would be better to have a, a, a better informed approach rather than, rather than just using that sort of, um, math to, to do it. And then you mentioned Statista. In order of um, getting to it, we'll move along in this slide. My computer didn't lock up here. Okay. So I did recognize that um, I think last time we had somebody in the room that was interested in a services market. So I wanted to put something out here for that. This one this example isn't graphical, but it's just a table from Angie.com. And so if we're taking a look at the home services market, which is what I was searching for, I came up with this chart and or this table. So this identifies the total addressable market as $657 billion, again, for the home services market. And that is broken down into the home improvement market, the home maintenance market, and the home emergency repair market. And I don't have a definition for each of those. If you went to the, there's actually a very comprehensive report here at Angie.com that breaks this down into more detail. But for our purposes here again, if we're trying to explain what the market opportunity is for our home services business, and we decide to focus on the home maintenance market, we can say that our total addressable market would be um, the 657 billion. Our serviceable market would be, for instance, if we wanna focus on maintenance would just be 105 billion of that. So that's how, again, we can, we can qualify the numbers that we're using based on the numbers, the, the data that we're able to find. Okay. But we would not want to ever say that it's a $657 billion opportunity, suggesting that I would be able to actually sell what I have to that entire market if I'm only focused on the maintenance market. That would just be, that would be a gross exaggeration. Okay, moving along. I went back to books on this one. This is for print books, so share of total print market in 2020. Again, if I'm coming out with a book and there are 750 million print books or books printed in 2020, this chart is showing us the growth rate on the, on the y-axis and the share of total print market on the x-axis. Again, we can characterize the market opportunity much better by, you know, with the benefit of a well-prepared chart that I just happened to find on this topic, we can characterize the market opportunity much better if we want to focus on young adult nonfiction. This right now is the smallest share of the market in 2020, smallest share, but it's the fastest growing, okay? So if I, if I was putting out a book that was suited to non- or that was of type of the genre or whatever, young adult nonfiction. And I wanted to focus right there. 
you know, then I would characterize my market opportunity as such, you know, that we have a very, very thin share of the total available print market at that point, but it's the fastest growing. So that might not be a bad place to invest. Okay. On the other end of the spectrum, just to move along here quickly, well-established market, adult nonfiction, it's the largest sector of the print market in 2020, but it's also among the slowest growing. So in terms of bringing out new material and attracting people to read my book, if I if I have the ability of writing non or young adult nonfiction, and I also have the ability to write adult nonfiction, I'd have a choice to make. Which of these types of material would I prefer to put out? Okay. All right. I'll just leave it at that. I'd have a choice to make. I don't know exactly which is the best choice in that case. And um, for Luis in the back, this one is for you specifically. So these are some of the prominent players in STEM education, K to 12 market. There's a whole bunch of companies that have STEM related material that they're, that they're um, putting out. I found that at this grandviewresearch.com on this report there. And they also characterized the market size value in 2022 as 44 billion growing over the next several years to 131 billion. So you know, pretty decent growth rate on that. That's, that's impressive. Okay. So in terms of being able to get into that particular market, there's a, there's a big opportunity there. So this, again, I found some of these reports just with basic Google searching. You can put in something like STEM education if you're in that space or whatever space you're looking at, and then just put in market um, report or something like that to be able to um, pull up some of this, this data. Sure. Would you say it's helpful for, for contestants to choose one or two customers to focus on? Sure, thank you. So the question again, if you're online is, um, would it be better to focus on a particular market? Definitely. For the reason that is kind of explained on this slide actually, is that there are only so many people that you're going to be able to satisfy. So by being selective about the particular opportunity that you're presenting, the particular market segment, if you will, the better. Because especially if you're a startup in a startup situation, you just can't get to everything. So being as selective as you can be about that will, will definitely be better. If you if you need to, um, yeah, I, wrong way to start that. It would be good to characterize what the next area of growth would be, maybe the second opportunity, the third opportunity in terms of being able to continue to grow from that first area. Okay, so you saw this slide basically last time, continuing the hamburger analogy that I started last week. There are people that consume your product, whatever it is, or use it, consume it, whatever. There are people who can actually get to it, and there are people who will pay you for it. So in this case of the hamburgers, people who have at least $15 to spend, have at least five minutes to get their hamburger, who eat in their car, we eat hamburgers, okay. so if we get through that whole kind of checklist, then that would be potentially somebody that you might be interested in. And as a follow on to this, you know, restaurants are really good about this. They will um, provide alternatives for people who don't eat beef hamburgers. They might provide chicken burgers or they might provide vegan burgers or something else. So those could be adjacent opportunities that you might want to consider as a matter of your market opportunity. Okay, this characterization, maybe you saw this last time, but again, we start with the broadest view in total addressable market, and then we narrow that down to served available market, and then our actual serviceable target market is the smallest component of that. 
Okay. When you're characterizing your market opportunity, this kind of goes hand in hand with what Lisa was asking about. It's best to focus from the bottom up rather than the top down. So those billions and billions numbers that I was sharing with you a few minutes ago, it's best not to start. That would be characterized in the upper right hand portion of this graphic. Okay, this area up here with all these burgers being sold, that let's think of that as our billions and billions of billions. But we don't start there. We, you know, we haven't even made our first one yet. Okay, for a startup company. So we're down, we're down here. We haven't even made our first one in the lower left hand corner. Okay. Units and income is zero. Time and expense, we're just starting. We haven't even done anything yet. It'll be a monumental milestone when we produce our first unit. We've actually made one. Better yet, we've sold one. Okay. And then somehow a miracle happens with this arrow and we get into the billions and billions and billions. Okay. But there are all kinds of things that need to happen in this, in this a miracle happens here arrow. We need to scale up our production. We need to scale up our supply chain. We need to scale up our distribution. We need to scale up our sales. We need to scale up our marketing. So it's not just a matter of creating the second product, the third product, the fourth product, but we need to have an actual scale up on all these different aspects. And so when we're explaining our market opportunity, we need to have the adjacent storyline to say, here's how that's possible. And we need to be able to speak to our production, our supplier, distribution, and sales. Typically at the Bob Mark competition, presenters will not go into this type of detail there, but it's, it's good to have that, we say, in your hip pocket, so to speak, so that when you're asked any questions about those things, are you actually going to produce enough units that is going to justify you to be able to generate a million dollars in sales that you have some sort of informed answer to how you're actually going to be able to produce that. And contract manufacturing is a good answer. You don't necessarily have to produce that product yourself. You could hire that out to somebody, some contract firm to be able to produce it initially. And then further down the line, you can start to do the actual manufacturing yourself if it's that type of product. Okay. All right, so moving right along, just some things to keep in mind here. Never use arbitrary proportions. So it's tempting to say, well, it's a $70 billion market. I only want one half percent of that. We call that the kiss of death. That means you have no idea. You're picking a number. Okay, so using secondary research, some of the stuff that I've been showing you is, is useful in that regard. Using the industry associations and market studies that sometimes can be found that can be help that they can be helpful to informing your, your storyline. And then I, I mentioned this before, you can go to Statista. And again, um, when you log in from Michigan Tech, you get this nice welcome message, welcome Michigan Technological University. So if we do some searching in here, we can find some reports that might help to inform our um, presentation. So here's a Here's a report that has to do with women among entrants to higher education and the effects of that. Okay, if we're looking at the Asia Pacific region, there's some data, et cetera. So lots of reports come up just by plunking in a simple search in that regard. So these pieces of data can be very useful when it comes to being able to inform the presentation that you're making. So I would highly, highly, highly recommend that you do some searching with this tool and reference that in your presentation or in your business plan or whatever the case may be. And sometimes this doing some basic searching here will open the door to more questions, may help to inform some other aspects of your business like supply, the supply of a product may help to inform the pricing of products. Um, you know, more with regard to who your actual users are. Your, your customers, things of that nature, who the key suppliers are, okay? So 
Again, the Statista, if you were to use this from outside the university, you would be paying hundreds of dollars for these reports that are available on here. As a student, you're free to use them for our purposes without any additional cost to you. Okay, and you can always come back to that, but just to kind of get through our material here. Be prepared to answer the question, why do you believe your estimates are realistic? So for most of us, we, we are good about informing that question with data. So if we can find some data that substantiates what we're telling people, that can be a good position to be in when it comes to presenting your, your opportunity. And then use results from your customer discovery discussion. So we talked last time about the value proposition and matching that to our customer segment. That happens by way of talking to people. So in as many as we can reach, try to talk to people who would potentially have some influence over the purchasing decision. They might be somebody who would actually use it, or they might be somebody who would not actually use it, but they might be the ones who would actually purchase it and then provide it to their organization or to somebody else who, who needs it. Or they might be um, somebody who actually wants to prevent you from being successful with this. So they might have a competing technology. It's great to talk to competitors as well to find out what their thoughts are about, about that opportunity. You don't have to tell them exactly what you're doing, but find out as much as you can about what some of the obstacles might be as well. Okay. All right, so I put in here a couple of links that, again, we can share out the slides, but there's a million of these links out there that could take you to lists of industry trade organizations. This one from Rutgers has got, let me just pull it up, I guess. This one is kind of interesting. Libraries are good about this. I just happened to pull up this one. As far as industry research, there's a lot to be said in all of these different categories of um, business planning, let's say. So there might be industry ratios that will be material to the, to the opportunity that you're working with. There might be, if you're working in a service industry, you might be able to find some information about that. So again, lots of industry associations come to mind here. It's good to take a look at their websites and find what might be some very useful information to informing your business decisions. Okay, so I just put those couple up there, but other libraries have a lot of good information as well. Industry associations on the supply side and then market associations on the, on the um, customer side can can be invaluable when it comes to providing reports. And um, just another aside on that, the last iCore session that we went through, we had a number of companies in there. There was one that was interested in. Um, there's a there's a participant in iCore that was interested in repowering. Um, small construction equipment like skid steer loaders and things like that with, with battery powered um, systems. And it didn't take long at all. And I was actually able to find an industry association that had produced a report that actually gave the entire list of all of the different companies that have small construction equipment machinery that are either have already repowered with with battery technology or looking at doing it. So, you know, sometimes you just find the gold nugget, but sometimes you, sometimes it's harder to find or it may not exist yet, requiring a little bit more work on your part. So again, hopefully this is helpful when it comes to informing your presentation at the business model competition. We hope that you'll be signing up for that. That's January 24th, I think. Yes, yeah, January. So, and what time does that? That's at 5.30 and it's gonna be in club. Um, and we are hosting free event discussions with all public. And even if you don't pitch, you're invited. It's a good time. It's fun to just listen to students pitch and support different support people. And, um, yeah. Okay. So just a quick plug for that. 
And I know we're about at time here and some of you have things going on um, starting soon. So just wanted to, again, reach out in the sense of everyone that's listed on here, Lisa, who's here um, with me in the room, Jim Baker, our Associate Vice President for Research and Administration, um, is a font of information when it comes to being able to characterize these business opportunities and, and converse with you about the, this material as well. I'm available for you, as well as uh, Professor Elias Gary, who also is an entrepreneurship instructor in the College of Business. So any of us you know, are certainly available to help you as, you as it relates to helping you think through your opportunity a little bit more. Um, one of the things I like to do is not just talk with people, but actually get into the data itself and let's see if we can find something that will actually help to inform your idea. So, so that's what I've got for now. I'll stop sharing my screen. So and thank you, Professor Payne. This is incredibly helpful. Thank you. All right. We have a few more questions um, or a few more minutes here. Any other questions that I could answer for you right at this time. For example, sure. like uh, you have your product and you are trying to, you have an MVP and you are trying to uh, sort of like try, start to ship it out. And uh, should you just look for the first customer and like you say, hopefully look for a miracle in getting more customers or should you wait to get a certain number of customers that can be able to offset your costs, then start shipping your product up. Okay, so you have a minimum viable product and you're you're wondering about how to actually start the channel distribution for that. So the term minimum viable product has embedded in it the understanding that you have a market already defined for that. If you don't have a market defined for your product, you shouldn't have built one in the first place. So, and taking that a little bit further is that there should be some qualification of that market before you build the first one. So back when I was working in industry full-time, we had the expression, we don't do anything for free. That if somebody is going to actually use our product, they're going to pay for it. And that can be a matter of developing the first one. So for instance, there are, this, this happens where you may have a customer that you identify that needs your product. You get them to pay for the first one and you retain the ability to sell more of them. Okay, and you can build that into your, your business model. You can build that into your pricing structure. So they may have um, maybe most favored nation provision on price, for instance. So nobody will ever be able to get the price at a lower cost than they get it but you might be able to take that product to an adjacent customer or industry and be able to sell an adjacent market and be able to continue selling it. And you had somebody else pay for it at the actual development of it. Okay, so the, the, the market research and the customer discovery that you did in order to be able to justify your, your using the expression minimum viable product should be a good starting point when it comes to actually selling that product then. So in that sense, you can take pre-orders on something before you even develop it or before you actually make it available. So by the time that you start to distribute your product, you've already got some revenue. So you've sold some before you've actually even made the product. So you've taken pre-orders on it. Okay, so, and sometimes that can help with the financing of, of how you actually get those built too. And it might be a low margin product at first where you don't make a lot of money on the first, you know, few units or the first hundred or thousand or whatever, but you're able to get enough of them made so that you can start creating some, you know, word of mouth, you know, um, interest in the product and be able to sell more of them, or you might be able to ramp up some marketing efforts based on, the experiences that people are starting to have with the product. So again, many different ways to be able to approach that, but it comes back to my own experience, which I have found to be the most successful is don't make any until you're sure that you actually have somebody 
already in mind committed to paying you for it. Don't take that risk. Okay. That's a great question. Any any others? Any questions online? All right, well, hearing no other questions, um, again, I'd make the uh, invitation again to reach out anytime, you know, not only for the competition, if that's your plan, but there are other competitions as well um, that are available to you. Check the Husky Innovate website. This is doing a good job in terms of working with our marketing folks and to get the, to get to keep that updated with opportunities that come along and, and you know, or maybe you're planning on just working on your own business on the side. That's perfectly fine. I'm not participating in those necessarily, but uh, we can maybe hook you up with the Small Business Development Center that we have here at Michigan Tech to help talk through some of these things or we can work with you in other ways as well. So that's all that I have for now. So thanks a lot.